All right, come on in, have a seat. It is my favorite day of the week because we get to talk about the biggest stories in pop culture. Today on the podcast, you're going to hear about the drama on Goodreads that made an author lose a two-book deal. And the number one movie on Netflix right now, I honestly can't stop talking about it. I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. This is Commotion. Okay, first, let me just remind you about Goodreads. It's kind of like Yelp. It's like, kind of like Yelp for literature. It's an online platform where you can post book reviews. And I think Goodreads generally has this wholesome brand, right? Like, it's like this idea of this is where book lovers get together. They get to geek out about their fandom. It could also give an author a significant boost in publicity. But when anything gets as big and as popular and as powerful as Goodreads has become – there's always going to be people who try to game the system. This happened recently, but it didn't just happen in a regular way. It happened in a truly bizarre and spectacular fashion. And it backfired so badly on the author that he made her lose a two-book deal with Penguin Random House. Anyway, the group chat is here. We're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about other big stories this week. Dale Richardson is here. Cyrus Marcus Ware is here. Sarah Ty Black is here. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the show. I'm so happy that you're here to just sort through all this. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi. I love, Jael, you're kind of like just shaking your head, even before we even begin. Um, every, t- every time I come on here, I'm just like, the topics, I'm just amped. Like, I'm ready to roll all these. You know these what? <laughs> that's the energy that I want on the show. So that's great. Let's bring that amped energy to talk about Goodreads. <laughs> The first question is actually to you. Before we get into Mm -hmm. this most recent drama, can you just like describe what Goodreads has kind of become and why it's become such a fraught place for for authors? Well, I mean, I don't know if Goodreads is any more fraught than any other part of social media, right? Mm. It's it's a social media platform. It just happens to be about books. You know, it's like rate my professor for book readers and and for writers, (laughs) right? You can just say whatever you want about whoever you want, however you want. You can give a plot summary for the entire book in your comments. Like you can, it is just chaos of readers. And so you go on there and you can rate books and that can help them, but it can also hurt them. I, I mean, I'll tell you when my first novel came out when gutter child came out i thought goodreads was gonna be so fun and i was like this is great i'm gonna (laughs) connect with my readers well it took like three reviews for me to be like and shut it down shut (laughs) the whole thing down like i just could not handle i i got a three-star review almost lost my mind and and the thing is the thing is it's because and i'll speak for myself i know not all writers are as fragile as i am but we can be quite fragile folks we've written these (laughs) things we've spent time on them we want people to love them. We do not want to hear the person that's like, this is boring. Um, and so I think it's a really tricky place for writers to go to, yeah. to get their fix and their fill. Yeah. And I think if you just treat it as like social media and like stay out in the ways that you need to, that's like an important personal guideline for a writer to take. But listen, I don't think of myself as a particularly fragile person. I can take like hard feedback. <laughs> but the thing that has rattled me the most is this one-star review on Goodreads. My book mm-hmm. came out last year. And this guy named Charles, you guys, he wrote this review and the review was like something like, I gave up on page 96. I do not care to read about someone's, you know, travel from Sudan to Canada and how their life changed. I was like, my guy, that's literally on the book jacket. I don't understand (laughs) what made you pick up the book in order to give it a one star. But that's me. I'm I'm fine. I'm as you can see, I'm clearly over it. Okay, Cyrus, we got (laughs) Watch your back, Charles. Uh, (laughs) Well, Sarah, the craziest part is that what I found out later is that, like, this person regularly does this. He's known as, like, One Star Charles, and he is (laughs) – and it's, like, a bit of a badge of honor. Like, that's the kind of environment we're operating in when it comes to Goodreads. But, okay, this is all the background. Cyrus, I got to give people the background on this most recent drama. So it involves this writer. Her name is Kate Corain. She's a YA writer from Los Angeles. She's admitted, she's admitted to making eight fake Goodread accounts, boosting her own book with positive reviews. And then she took it a little further and she left these scathing reviews on other people's debut books. Her friends' debut books, like people that she knows, those those are the people that she left bad reviews for. Many of the authors that she targeted are racialized YA writers. Cyrus, what was your reaction when you read the story, when you heard about the story? 
I mean, I was just sort of probably like many people who are listening right now, kind of uh, surprised and shocked by this, because, of course, it seems so outrageous. This, yeah. the, you know, creating there was the creation of the eight fake Goodreads accounts, but then also the creation of a fake friend <laughs> named Lily, who she alleged had made the, the Goodreads accounts initially before admitting that she had done it herself. Uh, look, you know, this is an author who had uh, her whole career in front of her, a two book deal that was just the beginning. Yeah. You know, so many, so much good buzz about her work on its own merit. There was absolutely no need to go and do this uh, and to, and, and in particular, to, to try to beat the system through this uh, creation of the fake accounts. And then there's the issue of targeting the other racialized YA authors. And that is just something, I mean, you mentioned that these were some of her quote unquote friends. I'm not yeah. sure she understands the definition of that word because, <laughs> you know, and ultimately, you know, you don't do that kind of thing to your friends. But this idea that, a, that an author who wasn't racialized, you know, would go after BIPOC authors and particularly downvote their work at a time when racialized YA authors, particularly in science fiction, and fantasy. This is what Octavia Butler was on about yeah. in her work in advocacy. She was like, look, this is a field that is very white dominated, that doesn't make space for black authors, that doesn't make space for racialized authors. And she was trying to change that. And now we're finally in a moment where some people are able to break through and to get these book deals and to start putting their work out. Mm. And you're going to go and downvote all of their books before before they've even come out. You know, And this is the part that was so <laughs> we outrageous. We keep forgetting so me, that. I was the books are not even out yet. But they hadn't even come out yet. Yeah. So it, it really seemed like uh, white supremacy writ large. It seemed like privilege and and sort of this idea of, of I guess, like a selfish kind of ownership of the world. Mm. I was really disturbed by this story. Uh, Sarah, Ty, we have to say, okay, two things. One, Cyrus mentioned it there. Uh, Kate, the author at the center of this drama, she sort of invented the story of saying – what ended up happening is my friend Lily created all these fake accounts in order to what try to help me. Is. What, what, <laughs> <laughs> what had happened is, and then she sort of was like, Lily did this. And then she invented this entire exchange between her and Lily. And then she was like, actually, I'm also Lily. Like, I invented this conversation. I was like, Lily, don't do this. You're hurting all my friends. But also, she loses her publishing deal. She loses her agency representation. So she writes this apology on social media. And Sarah Tai, in her apology, she blamed her new medication. She explained that she's treating mental illness. What did you think of the apology that she wrote? I just like wonder what medication is it specifically that makes her racist? Um, <laughs> as someone who's also on a lot of medication, as someone who also <laughs> has ex lived experience with being depressed, being neurodivergent, I'm a sober alcoholic. I may be the commotions resident sober alcoholic. I don't know. So I do have a lot of <laughs> compassion for those things in general. But I think that white women like K -K -K Kate uh, yeah. really love to weaponize uh disability and neurodivergence to cover up tracks, which are clearly not just one-offs. I think that anyone who also has been uh, located in any of these lived experiences, like even if you're not an alcoholic, we've all caused harm. We've mm -hmm. all, we all continue to cause harm in certain ways, but it's the fact that this was not only just such a bad scheme, like you can't even be a good villain. I think that if white women owe us anything, it's like, if you're going to be a villain, be a good one. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, it's just such a bad scheme that was over time with continued multiple steps. Like, I just don't really understand. I mean, the, it's not that I don't, it's exactly that I do understand mm. centering a condition as a as an apology as a way to justify your actions mm -hmm. as a way to kind of not accounting for them and instead forwarding yourself as the victim and i think one of the most glaring things for me in that apology was her essentially being like i am now going to be uh, moving forward with intensive inpatient treatment which is mm. like yes love that for you get the care you need but also like you can't post an apology and be like okay bye like that is the opposite of accountability that sure. is such a cowardly way to posi position an apology because it doesn't allow people to engage with it to respond to you mm -hmm. uh, jail mm -hmm. i have to say one yeah. part of the story that i found kind of compelling in a I, I i confess to finding the story and the gossip around it really compelling like i can't you know stop looking away and someone found an old tweet of kate's and by old tweet i mean from like six months ago that was like hey 
I'm really anxious about being canceled before my book comes out. If you guys are going to cancel me, can you do it now? And it's like, mm-hmm. mm, I, this would have been a time when she probably would have had those eight fake accounts already created. So it just seems mm-hmm. wild to me that she kind of predicted that this would end up happening. But also, she just published her first novel. She's not a particularly well-known writer, but this is a situation that blew up because it started all these conversations about competition, about racism in the publishing industry. What did you take away from this whole conversation happening, Jail? Well, first of all, this year, one of the biggest books of the year was Yellow Face by Arif Kwong. And if you haven't read that book- It's about this. Interest, it, it is about this. Yes. It, there are so many parallels that I'm like, did she read this? What is her problem? <laughs> but I think what's what's really fascinating that's really hard to talk about oftentimes in these situations, but important to talk about, is there is this, as we raise awareness about marginalized folks and marginalized communities, mm. as we pay attention to voices we haven't paid attention to in the past, there is an automatic- and probably unavoidable blowback mm. where people are like, but, but, but what about the good old days? But, but, <laughs> but what about, there are articles now by mid white men that are just like, but it is so hard for us these days because everybody wants diversity. Mm. You know, there's this real um, stress. I think that white folks uh, can sometimes take in and say like, but what about me? What about me when all these good things are happening in the world? What about me? Mm. And that's what I think is really interesting about the Kate Crane situation, about who she targeted and how she positioned it, how she's positioning herself and her apology. It's really trying to be like, but I am the victim here. Mm -hmm. I am the one who was hurt. I did this out of fear and anxiety. And what I think is so important to look at and you know, Cyrus and Sarah have both talked about this is the fact that she had this multi-book deal. To get a publishing deal is very difficult. It mm-hmm. is hard for everybody in every situation. She had beat that. Not only had she beat that, but she had a book and another book guaranteed in mm-hmm. a sense, right? She didn't have to put that kind of pressure on her debut to blow up because she had two books already set up to, to sort of give her this journey. So her attack, honestly, on these other writers, that's the part that bothers me the most. Upvote mm. yourself, whatever. I don't care. But the downvoting and the attack on these other writers that were friends mm-hmm. is the part that seems particularly malicious and problematic. And the thing that I think we have to really think about in terms of these other writers, because the other thing that bothers me about this is that Kat, Kate's now, I, I'm in therapy, I'm, I'm, I'm retreating away. But these writers who she's downvoted, they're they're out in the world. People are, are um, you, you know, you can say it's good publicity, but they're dealing with this for no reason other than they knew her or were on a list with her. Yeah. And instead of writing their books and like enjoying their debuts and having fun, they're being asked questions. They're being asked to defend things. They're being asked to explain things in ways that they just should have been left out of. And this is the other thing that I think um, white, vo- white writers can do to marginalize voices is they can heap on extra work for them mm. um, just to make it easier on themselves and then kind of walk away. And that's happened in in, Can- in Canlit as well. There have been situations where there's been editors who have acquired a bunch of marginalized voices, done something terrible about it, and then they've been dipped out and those writers have to deal with the blowback, mm-hmm. the people attacking them. And so I think what really troubles me is the way that um, this whole story reflects, I think, a larger issue in literature mm. and in even larger communities where a push to be more equitable, more caring, more mindful um, is met with resistance simply from those who are jealous or who feel personally threatened by the fact that more voices are being listened to than before. My name is Elamine mm-hmm. Abdul Mahmoud. You're listening to Commotion. On this podcast, we got Dale Richardson, Cyrus Marcus Ware, Sarah Ty Black. We are talking about the biggest arts and pop culture stories this week. And we're going to turn to Leave the World Behind. It is a new thriller starring Julia Roberts, Mahershala Ali, and Ethan Hawke. It is still the number one movie on Netflix in Canada right now. Let's listen to a bit of the trailer. I went online this morning and I rented us a beautiful house out by the beach. Oh, this is nice. Kids look so happy. Get a bat. I'm so sorry to bother you that this is our house. This is your house? We were 
driving back to the city. Then something happened. You want to stay here, but we're staying here. We are seeing ongoing cyber attacks across the country. Okay, so what you heard there is the premise of the movie. This is the family on vacation at this rental home outside the city. Then the owners turns up, turn up late at night, and they're like, look, there's been a citywide blackout. We are going to also need to be in our own home. And then it turns to be much more apocalyptic than that, much more tense than that trailer. Like, the music in that trailer sounds like a fun time. I want to hang out there. (laughs) Having watched the movie, I'm like, you are – it's a world of misery and tension for two hours and 21 minutes. Cyrus, I'm going to start with you. Let's talk about the Julia Roberts character. Amanda feels kind of like a a familiar archetype, but not one we've seen from Julia Roberts before. Tell us about Amanda. Who is she? Okay, so Amanda is a a white woman, wealthy, um, you know, able to, on a dime, pick up and book an elaborate, rolling uh, vacation home outside of the city because she, you know, she felt like it, uh, you know, and wanted something different for her family for that weekend. Yeah. Yeah, she needs a little break. Uh, She's not necessarily your full Karen. Like, maybe she's not calling the cops on the birder in the park, but she's definitely, you know, the stewardess who's asking whether I'm really supposed to be in business class, you know? She's... (laughs) Uh, uh, She knows Kate. She she knows knows Kate. Kate. (laughs) She she probably helped Kate with the Goodreads ads. But anyways, Amanda is uh, Amanda is is someone who uh, who is very um, has some implicit biases. Mm -hmm. So that when the the owners of this house show up on her doorstep, her first response is this this couldn't possibly be their house, Mm -hmm. and they were on their way to the Philharmonic Orchestra. How could that possibly be true? He's on the board. How could that possibly be true? How, yeah. As if black people weren't involved in 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 art and music, and yeah. you know. Anyways, she's uh, perfectly comfortable with the idea that she could afford to stay in the house, but the <laughs> idea that the actual owners would be able to stay in their own house seems outrageous to her. Sure. She's very suspicious, uh, and 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 immediately wanting uh, these black people to prove themselves to her, even though keeping in mind she is a stranger who has rented their Airbnb. Mm-hmm. Like she is the uh, l'étranger. She is the person who should be getting the questions asked of her, but instead she's interrogating them. So I would say Amanda is maybe not capital K Karen, but definitely leaning. You know, Mandy, Mandy has some issues. Mandy has some issues with black people <laughs> and in particular with, with issues related to class. The yeah. idea that black people need to always already be, be poor and not of the same economic status as her. I got to say, at the end of the movie, I'm not entirely sure she's worked through those issues. So there's there's a lot to be said about that. Um, we should say that the movie is based on a novel by the same name. That novel came out in 2020, and it was adapted by Higher Ground Productions. That's the Michelle and Barack Obama production company. I think that is interesting. I want to come back to that in a moment. But Sarah Tyler, we got to talk about Mahershala Ali's character. His name is George. He owns his vacation house. But even as the world is ending, he and his daughter are relegated to the basement of the house that they own. What does that say to you about like the ownership at the end of the world, do you think? I mean, it was probably my m- most favorite part of the film. Favorite. Like, it was so <laughs> upsetting. I didn't enjoy watching it, but yes. it was very effective. And as much as, like, if we look at the past three years of the pandemic, if you look at what's happening in Gaza right now, it's a very poignant way of pointing out the reality that, that at the end of the world, we still have respect end of the world. We still have respectability politics. We still have pandering to whiteness not wanting to upset whiteness in our kind of plea for, if not life, then safety. Mm. And I think that um, Mahershali was such an amazing, uh, amazingly cast person for this role. I think he like held that tension really well. And I think he's also like very, uh, uh, I mean, we'll go, we'll, we'll touch on the Obama soon, but I think that, (laughs) yeah, he really embodied that kind of tension, but also like need to please, if not just to um, keep, the boat from rocking, but also to keep their black family safe. You know what? Why don't we talk about the Obamas now? In Mm -hmm. your review of the movie, Sarah Ty, you wrote, there's a certain type of progressive cultural cachet that the movie leans into. What connect that to the Obamas for me, if you will. 
Well, as some of us may or may not know, this was the second film from the Obama's production imprint. And I was after thinking Fatherhood, after Fatherhood, right? Which is like a Kevin Hart movie. Is that what we're talking yeah, about? And, yeah. And, or maybe it was the third after Rustin. It was oh, that's right. one, of the, one of the beginning ones. Yeah. One of the first ones. And I was a lot of the time during this movie, I was sitting there thinking about what does it mean to have a president like Obama and his partner? Um kind of culturally approve of films like this. We saw how um, kind of viral his lists went during his presidency for his favorite books, his favorite movies. He had Mm -hmm. this kind of cultured air about him alongside also like, you know, bombing folks to death. So it was just very interesting to me to see a movie like this come out under that banner and then also kind of be um, rubber stamped in that way. And Mm. it, it just brought up a lot of like contradictions and complexities where I myself... I don't know. I'm kind of just like, I'm not falling for this. I'm not falling for this. I refuse to fall for this. I mean, th- there is something really interesting about the Obama rebrand, about like, the kind of conversation that they want to have, because yeah. you can have that conversation if you're any kind of other cultural leader. I'm not convinced you can have that if you're a former president. If you're a former president exactly. who has to account for all of the actions that they did in office, which are fundamentally different than like a business leader. Like if Melinda yeah. Gates is like, I want to fund movies, let's go. I absolutely yeah. 100%. If you are someone like the Obamas, I honestly do think that you have to have a different kind of conversation. And so mm. I, I feel all kinds of complicated about this. But listen, before mm. I let you guys go, I want to ask you what I should be reading or watching or listening to this mm. weekend. We got time for recommendations. JL, kick us off. Let's go. Oh, well, I'm just going to stick with the one that I recommended earlier, which is Yellow Face by R.F. Kuang. If you are uh, getting excited about this case, it is well written. It is well told. It is ironic. I feel like it's the exact type of voice you should be listening to when we're having these kinds of conversations. Um, The woman who wrote it um, and talking about it from a white woman's perspective. It's just fascinating in perspective and writing and language and plot. Mm. That's one. Uh, I what I love about Yellow Face is that it's like clearly the book of the year in the sense of like mm-hmm. people can't stop talking about it and it keeps being relevant in different ways. And then yeah. you get to this drama, and you kind of go like, "Oh wow, it is extremely and supremely relevant to to this particular conversation." Mm. Uh, Sarah Ty, what about you? This is a little out of left field, but I started love watching Oz. Oz. Um, Oz. Yeah, like the, the Wizard show. of Oz. No, no, okay, like sorry. The HBO show with <laughs> about uh, incarcerated folks that was on. It was like one of the first HBO. You don't know about Oz? Yeah. I do know about Oz. It's just like it, I just can't believe that I went to the Wizard of Oz prequel first. Mm. That was my bad. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's like, on me. Uh, very much like an actor's actor show. You get to see like J.K. Simmons, Edie Falco, B.D. Wong, kind of just like all spiral out in like thespian indulgence for better or worse i think it's also a very interesting kind of case study and like how one of like the first contemporary aka after the 80s prison dramas kind of um positioned incarcerated people on screen especially on hbo there's a lot of butts and a lot of penises it's a lot for me honestly Mm -hmm. um but that might be a plus for others (laughs) i've learned a lot of new words none of which i can (laughs) say on the radio um but yeah it's just like an interesting show i feel kind of like i'm an archaeologist watching it like huh interesting Mm -hmm. uh cyrus what about you? you what recommendations do you have for us I mean, I'm knee deep in uh, reading Elliot Page's book, Page Boy, mm. and uh, just loving it. I love that it's, you know, there's parts that are set in, ter- in Toronto, in Takarando, and, and you know, this this story uh, of this actor from Halifax, you know, from Chibuktuk, you know, from McMaggy, who who ends up going on to do all of these things and really about this journey of coming out. I've, I found it uh, fascinating. But after watching Leave, it, uh, Leave the World Behind, I really want to read the myth of black capitalism mm. uh, Earl uh, Hutchison you know it's coming out so I'm just sort of going to be looking for how to get that book and to sort of think through what does it mean when we think that uh, access to economic justice is going to get us uh, closer to an approximation of safety does mm. that really play out so I'm looking forward to my book list for 2024 you know what on that end I would like to add the recommendation that people watch leave the world behind because yes. I kind of want to keep having conversations about this but we got to leave it there in the meantime thank you to all of you for being here you guys are the best thanks again 
Bye. Of course. Listen, Dale Richardson is the author of Because You Are and Gutter Child. Sarah Ty Black is a freelance culture critic here in Toronto. Cyrus Marcus Ware is a visual artist, activist, and assistant professor at McMaster University. And that is it for the podcast. Listen, you can find any episode of the show anytime you like, wherever you get your podcasts. My name is Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. Check us out on Instagram. We are at Commotion CBC. I'm going to be here next week. If you're going to be here next week, I will be delighted to see you then.